On y va Ok. Bonjour à tous. Merci d'être là. Bienvenue au nom du, du Cercle des économies. Je suis au... Good morning, everybody. This panel on innovation, a major topic at the heart of these rencontres for economists. Traditionally, in econ economy classes, we talk about growth. And what's interesting with the present uh, period is that growth is no longer uh, really at, on top of the list. Uh, okay, and also innovation with the climate change and COVID, it was replaced as a subject that does not deal with the growth, but the possibility itself of continuing to, to live, to operate. You can't repeat the past. It's no longer possible. This is a, uh, therefore a new angle when you address this topic that is revisited by the economists. We have a, quite a diverse panel here, a lot of diversity. We're lucky to have people who work in uh, different industries, uh, Cyril Malarge, uh, the CEO and Director General of Soprasteria, Stéphane Israel, PDG of Ariane, CEO of Ariane Espace, Metana Vital, the founder and CEO of Infravia, Belinda Darqua, who, who is uh, 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 is going to be uh, in a remote place, uh, and Jean Bonas, the president of Philippe Maurice France. So the innovation is percolating in these different fields, not only the exchange of knowledge or new technologies, but we'll, we'll talk also about how this knowledge percolates within organizations in the uh, productive uh, um, fabric of the economy. So I'll ask my guests to take five minutes to say how in their sector, in their corporations, in their companies, with their experience, how the, these technologies percolate. And this will be the first part of this session, a kind of um, setting the stage. You know, Everybody will give us their point of view, where they, where they are in the economy. So all innovation percolates in, in, in the work scene. So in the second part, I will ask a question, address a question to each of the panelists to say, how do we articulate the innovation in private companies and the role of the state, of the regulator of public policies in all this? And we'll open the debate to the room afterwards, so Q&A. And we'll ask you to uh, address your questions to the panelists. So without further ado, I will uh, launch our, uh, ask our first uh, guest, uh, Cyril Malarge, the director, CEO of Sofest uh, Tirea. Thank you, Augustine. Thank you all. Good morning, everybody. So the topic of this conference is, in fact, the transformation through uh, technological progress. But I always like to go back on, there's transformation if we accept, only if we accept the uh, the change, accepting the transformation. So we, we have to accept the progress. And uh, the relationship we have with progress is always something interesting to, to, to look at. But without going back uh, centuries behind, if we take the, the 60s and after that, under the impulse of uh, De Gaulle, Pompidou, Giscard d'Estaing, or the French presidents, uh, uh, the, the uh, progress is the symbol of uh, um, uh, wealth, uh, it's the Concord, it's the TGV, and then there was a disenchantment. Uh, the, the technology was uh, less and less audible. Uh, globalization to an excess, uh, deindustrialization of our territory, uh, scandals, you know, medical uh, scandals, and thinking about the contaminated blood that dates back, the mediator. Um, affair, the uh, ecological issues, problems uh, of the last decades. I'm thinking of Chernobyl, I'm thinking of uh, uh, the uh, HCFC uh, cooling gases, and it's the uh, public um, word, uh, uh, voice that uh, is no longer used uh, on innovation, on major projects. On, and so uh, in the end, at the end of the day, before the pandemic in 2020, there was a survey that says that 75% of the French consider that they've become too dependent on technological progress. And that's the starting point. Uh, uh, of what happened. What happened after? Well, we had the pandemic, uh, and we had a, uh, we uh, were in a very key moment because we had to react. We had to react faced with the sanitary situation. We have to react with a view to a need for more sovereignty uh, that uh, came up uh, as a consequence of the sanitary condition. And then we had to react faced with the ecological situation. So when you look at what's happened in the last two years, it took two uh, year be 
to, to produce a vaccine with a technology where there's a lot of defines, you know, uh, uh, but it took, uh, it was very quick to come up with this vaccination. At the beginning, 40% of the French wanted to be vaccinated and at the end, 80% accepted. Uh, we had uh, the remote work, uh, homework, 41% uh, uh, in 2021 of people working from home. Uh, February 2021, 40 times more, uh, 19 million people consulting on the internet and so this gives me quite a lot of faith and I'm optimistic because the big stake that's ahead of us now is the ecological challenge. You all read the IPCC report 2022. We've got three years to, to shift uh, the curve, to change the curve of uh, greenhouse effect. Uh, emissions, uh, but it's without progress, without technology, it's impossible. So we have to learn how to consume better, consume less, and it's through uh, technological progress that we will manage because somehow we have to take decisions uh, that may sound brutal, eventually brutal, and it's technological progress that will enable us to take these decisions and, in it, and uh, make sure that they are accessible and uh, acceptable. Uh, I go back to the digital sector, it's my work, I mean, it's my, my specialty. The position, the place of the, 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 the digital is essential because it's the digital solutions that will enable to uh, gain momentum, speed up this capacity. And it's uh, even uh, more important since uh, the digital uh, sector uh, means that we need talent and we need to set a mission. Uh, why? The, uh, continue to develop the digital wall, probably to contribute to, to save the world. Uh, our customers today, their concern is to see how can I be at zero emissions as soon as possible. Obviously, uh, the digital evolution it will strongly contribute. Just a figure, at Soprasteria, we trained 16,000 of our collaborators to echo design, echo development uh, uh, schemes to make sure that we would develop in, uh, information system or IT systems that are use up the less, least energy possible. Yes, we are a key moment in our history. Uh, I'm very confident, I'm very optimistic. We need to react, but I think the citizens have understood that progress could be a, a lever. And uh, of course, the digital uh, played a very important role in that. We need talent, and in a way, uh, well, we have a, a remission ahead of us to face the uh, the challenges of tomorrow. Thank you. So our next speaker, Stéphane Israel, will talk about space. Space, Ariane. Okay. Good morning, everybody. A few words on space, uh, outer space. That is, I'm. Uh, uh, the head of uh, Ariane Espace, where the company who exploit and implement the uh, rockets, the better known is Ariane. There's another rocket also that's called Launcher that's called uh, Vega. And our uh, recent activity, you've heard of it, we had a very nice partnership with NASA. Uh, we uh, launched the James Webb Telescope that will send us its first images on the 12th of July. So be very attentive on what you can find on the uh, website of the NASA. And then we signed with Amazon um, an enormous order of uh, 18 Ariane 6 launchers to deploy the uh, Amazon constellation. So this is uh, the transition with what's happening in space. You know, we're in the third age of the space age. The first age was the age of powers, uh, the east-west uh, rivalries, Russia and the US. And this age uh, finished when the Apollo program was ended in 1973. And it's uh, a lot of these engineers that were trained in the Apollo program um, with the, uh, all the power this gave, um, who uh, uh, disseminated and created the internet in the United States. And we see the space is uh, very uh, in, in, in relationship with the uh, uh, breakthroughs. And the second age was between 1975 and 1980. Uh, up to, to 2010, where the market was a bit was stabilized, the actors were stable. Uh, they had 20 or 25 uh, communication satellites, uh, commercial satellites to be launched. There was Ariane, and there were a few Russian launchers, the space shuttle, the U.S. 
space shuttle and the uh, space station, of course, and and some uh, Earth observation satellites. It's a moment. Well, this, the space became more bourgeois, and it can, so it was consolidated. And we're at a time in our history, in the third age of the space adventure, that is uh, disrupted. This disruption is linked to several factors, several reasons that are self-supporting. Uh, the gov uh, U.S. government decided to 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 per buy its services differently, to 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 make call for tenders to private actors. That's uh, actors. That's how SpaceX was started. Eighteen billion dollars from the U.S. government to SpaceX on the basis of a, a private initiative. So new members, uh, new uh, public orders in the U.S. that will uh, enable the income uh, of. Uh, uh, new new players, Mr. Musk, Mr. Bezos, that are today in space. It, they weren't in a few years ago. And if you want, there's a drastic drop of access costs uh, to space, whether for launchers or satellites. And this uh, drop was uh, permitted by the new technologies for satellites. A few examples before satellite needed to carry a lot of uh, fuel to move in orbit. And with the electrical pr propulsion, you eliminate that and you have satellites that are uh, uh, twice lighter uh, than before. And so they increase the load. Uh, the satellites were uh, working on a strict zone with uh, limited data possibilities or capacities and uh, latency, uh, but these three barriers were lifted. You, we have what we call flexible antennas that enable the satellites to be reconfigured. Uh, we have tra tra data transmission possibilities uh, that have uh, evolved uh, quite a lot. And uh, with the lower orbits, you have today satellites that uh, uh, enable um, broad or internet applications and in the field of observations where you had a resolution capacity that was uh, several meters sometimes 10 meters today it's 30 centimeters can you believe that and now you can see a license plate for example on a car from space uh, rockets uh, with rockets it was a revolution the revolution of re the reuse the shuttle was a reusable uh, launcher that failed because it was too expensive it was really expensive to uh, rehabilitate the the, 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 the the shuttle between two launches and with the uh, competitor SpaceX well there was a technology that found the right the stroke the right economic balance that didn't exist in the past so drastic drop in uh, access costs for space uh, democratization of space and essentially a phenomenon that they call uh, the gold the low orbit rush between 1500 kilometers uh, from Earth will be uh, widely used. Uh, and uh, it's all these enormous uh, low orbit uh, constellations. To give you an idea, today you have 5,000 sta satellites, operational satellites in low orbit. There will be 50,000 in 10 years from now. And the space market, which had a value of $300 billion, will move to 1,100 billion. Uh, in 10 years. And so in this context, well, what are the Europeans doing? In terms of satellites, the European are really up there with these reconfigurable uh, satellites. Airbus and Thales have the excellent products to offer. Uh, we're launching uh, uh, U.S. satellites, and we're totally neutral, but we have to uh, accept it that Airbus and Thales, Thales have ex excellent products to offer. On the rocket side, launcher side, you can say two things. We'll move from Ariane 5 to Ariane 6. Incremental evolution. Ariane 6 is uh, twice as better as Ariane 5. Twice better because it's uh, half the price and enabling more complex missions with uh, um, new engines, new launchers, um, uh, industrial approaches that help low, lower costs. Uh, and there's also the 3D printer printing, but it's an incremental evolution. And this uh, uh, evolution will enable us to to address these new markets uh, like constellations, the contract we signed with Amazon, for instance, in parallel, because we need to know uh, how to walk on both legs. Uh, in parallel, we're working with the more disruptive or breaking technologies. We're preparing a new launchers, reusable, working on with oxygen and methane, and the Ariane Group is working on a demonstration to recover the stages. Uh, we are 
uh, using the 3D printing technologies. And in 2030, we should be able to have a new family of launchers. But I insist on the fact that we have a strategy which is incremental and uh, breaking technology. It's a result of our governance, of our history. I'm oh, pleased you have to land now. <laughs> Uh, Augustin tells me I've, uh, uh, maybe <laughs> I've talked too much rubbish. No, um, this, uh, there's sustainability. That's, uh, if you have a lot of satellites in orbit, uh, this raises the issues of the capacity of state to stay clean and sustainable. So uh, technological progress is fine, but you have to uh, make sure that it's sustainable. Thank you so much. And now my best territory. Um, hello. Vincent Levita, from an investor's point of view, just to start, the, the title of the panel on progress, there was, it was clear recently in the transmission of progress that was supposed to go from economic progress, more wealth, which would allow social progress with more distribution, which would then allow political progress, more democracy, and finally geopolitical progress with more peace. This transmission of progress, it seems to me, is less obvious uh, today. It's a shame, but we have to ask the question why. If we look over long periods of time, technological progress made it possible to improve living conditions. That's undeniable. It allowed uh, globalization, exchanges, uh, trade and culture, and an increase in wealth in general. But it also caused pollution of the planet, the concentration of wealth, demographic, uh, uncontrolled demographic problems. So from the point of view of, the, of a financer, I run an investment fund which was focused initially on infrastructure, so low technology, ports, airports, uh, and motorways. Technology didn't wait for us and ask our opinion. They, it came in everywhere. So we financed energy transition, renewable energies, in particular energy storage. We financed health, education, and digital infrastructure, and we also financed technology companies to organize and operate all of this. And if I take a few terms, I don't have much time. So if I take the theme of energy transition, clearly we can't avoid or neglect the fact that technological progress has led us to create uh, energy efficient technologies that are uh, much more efficient today. It's competitive uh, uh, renewable energies. Even without subsidies, the state is making money again on these subsidies. So energy storage, hydrogen in the future, this was all made possible by technological innovation. That's not enough. There's still a lot that we have to do. We have to optimize efficiency, recycling. These are fields where technological progress must help. The point that I wanted to make today is that Technology involves engineers, uh, industrial companies, things we know how to do. It takes time and work and resources, of course, and skills. What's more complicated is the organization. It's the governance. It's fluidifying the process from research up until industrialization. The state has to help without helping too much because when it works, it's better if the state doesn't get involved. But it's a public public policy comes from the state for renewable energies. It's it's simple, but sometimes controversial. There's a public policy over 20 years that made it possible to go towards a competitive system. It wasn't perfect. We missed uh, certain things, but the state is running their public policy. Industry does research, industrializes, and finances. Fina when the uh, system works, uh, it's not hard to find financial backers. Be brief, please. I wanted to say a few words about health. We, had, we did find a vaccine in 12 months. We organized remote working in just a few weeks, and that's an incredible performance that we should uh, note. But that also showed everything that doesn't work in the health system, the problem with capacity, competencies, uh, abs absurd working hours, and technology can help solve these problems. My point is really that I want to say 
technological progress has uh, done its job. There's still work to be done. And we can dream of a system where the patient, to talk about health, is uh, supported through along their journey at home, in hospitals, in retirement homes. We can dream of a system where energy is better planned and organized. Technology will be present. What we need to make it work is simple public policy that is constant over time, where the state has a, an overarching vision and stands back from the details. It's skills. It's the question. The question of skills is uh, key. The French so far have been good. We have the, amongst the best engineers. We need to be able to retain them. And, uh, and use their skills. And financing is the simple part. Money is available. Uh, financers are, are intelligent. When it works, they finance. When it doesn't work, they don't finance. So for that, we need a simple framework. You have to conclude, Vincent, please. The message is convergence of private and public stakeholders, industry, finance. This is how we're going to uh, solve the problem. Thank you. Now we're going to hear from Belinda Darqua remotely. She should come up on the screen. Belinda is a national coordinator of the Gala Tech Lab. Welcome. Belinda, can you tell us what you do and how you work on innovation? The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, as you've already introduced, my name is Belinda Dakwa and I work with Ghana Tech Lab. Um, I work as the community associate and I'm also the national lead for the Ghana Ladies in Tech community. Um, Ghana Tech Lab, basically what we do here um, is to enable startups from all across the country to build. And we also do digital skills training. Um, over the past few years, we've realized in Ghana that a lot of other countries are progressing. Technology has become the order of the day. And individuals who are um, making sure that they are leveraging on technology other countries that are really leveraging on technology are expanding, they are moving on. And so here in Ghana, as a developing country, we as the Ghana Tech Lab found it very key to introduce trainings that will help individuals here in Ghana, especially the youth that are not employed, to be able to understand the impact of technology and how they can leverage technology to gain employment, as well as build businesses and startups. Now, over the past few years in Ghana, um, our digital transformation has been slow. Um, if you compare it to other countries, Ghana's acceleration when it comes to digitalization has been quite slow. But there has been introductions of innovation hubs, um, such as Ghana Tech Lab, that have been able to introduce, even into the very remote and rural areas, we've been able to introduce tech and digitalization to these very remote areas. And through this transformation, we have been able to train so far over 2,000 um, individuals who were not employed. They have gained employable skills and are currently employed. Most of them have um, jobs now. A lot of them are also focusing on their businesses. And incubators and accelerators have also increased in Ghana. The government has um, been trying to introduce, you know, trainings and programs that would aid the youth to understand digitalization and how it can be leveraged to improve the country. Um, there's been development partners such as the World Bank that has recently invested um, some sums of money into Africa, which Ghana Tech Club is a beneficiary of. And so it is evident that now the country, including, um, you know, the government has come to understand the importance of leveraging tech to um, make sure that the country is moving on. However, as I mentioned, there are very um, parts of the country, there are certain parts of the country that 
are not benefiting from these um, technologies because of where they are. Now in Ghana, for instance, everything happens in the capital city, which is Accra. And so if you are outside of Accra, then you would realize that you're not, you know, getting access to some of these benefits. And so Ghana Tech Lab, for instance, ensures that we have partners all across the country such that even if you are even in the remote part of Ghana, you're able to benefit from some of these um, opportunities that we offer. And it is very, um, you know, evident that we need to do more as a country to be able to ensure that we are improving, to be able to ensure that we are, um, you know, moving ahead. When COVID hits, for instance, um, a lot of companies realized that we had to work from home. And it was quite a challenge because that was not the way to go. That was not the way we were doing things. But because um, we realized that there was technology that we could leverage, we began to work with it. And within two to three weeks, people had adapted to using um, you know, tech to work from home. And that has become a norm right now in Ghana, where com most companies allow their employees to work from home. Um, the government has also introduced some policy measures that are helping the adoption of um, technology for economic development. Um, about two years ago, there was a trip that um, enabled um, startups, you know, to to go in for a startup act that would, you know, facilitate the development of their businesses and, and their programs. And so far, it's been good. Um, it was launched last year, and that is what we are seeking to do as a company, Ghana Tech Lab, are seeking to, you know, open up the technology space such that more individuals have the skills training they need. And we are supporting through our incubation and acceleration programs. We are supporting even more entrepreneurs to, you know, start up their businesses and move in from there. And so um, for Ghana, there is a lot that we need to do. Um, it is key that we continue to, you know, have conversations concerning how we can really transform our economy through the text that technology provides. Um, there is the need for, you know, investments, legislations and collaborations across, you know, internally and externally as well, because obviously um, other countries have the know-how, they have the knowledge, they have the skills. And so there's the need for collaborations for us to, you know, tap into such knowledge, tap into such skills, and then transfer such knowledge into the country such that the unemployed youth in Ghana could also, you know, benefit from such things. And so, of course, there's the need for infrastructure and capital investments. And I think one of the panelists that if the, the plan is good, then there will probably be, you know, some form of investments going in there. And so for that to happen, we need to be able to make sure that the individuals in the country are equally equipped with their skills and their knowledge. And that is what Ghana Tech Lab is seeking to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Berinda. <laughs> OK, and now Jeanne Paulès, president of the Philippe Morris. Jeanne uh, Paulès, president of uh, Philip Morris France. Jeanne, can you explain how innovation works at Philip Morris? Hello, everyone. As an introduction, I would like to underscore the fact that transformation through technological progress only makes sense if it's done with the will to have an impact on the collective for the common good. And I would add to this that we can't forget that companies are part of the solution to the problems of the world. And the COVID crisis that we've just been through, we saw it, it's been made reference to in a record time a vaccine was developed and without companies that never would have happened. So on this point, Philip Morris International, which is a leader in uh, tobacco products in the world, cigarettes, if we uh, forget about the Chinese the monopolies, we're investing to develop solutions to the consequences of uh, tobacco addiction on human health. We've invested nine billion in the last few years in R&D to develop solutions that would be a better choice for smokers than to continue to smoke. These solutions are based on a simple principle that they don't burn uh, tobacco or liquid uh, uh, nicotine 
uh, they need to just w heat it through other devices. So the problem doesn't concern tobacco and nicotine, but it's really the burning of its combustion. When there's combustion, there's smoke, and it's when in the smoke that you inhale, there are 6,000 toxic products that could be harmful for your health. So non-combustion alternatives are a better choice for the one billion smokers around the world. We also filed more than 700 patents with the uh, IP uh, registries across the world. And in the last year, we've created a team of a 1,000 researchers, scientists, technicians to help us develop this portfolio of solutions which are better for smokers and to continue to develop new technologies that will serve smokers. We are ambitious but uh, our ambition is uh, reachable. We want to build a world without cigarettes. It's possible today because the technology exists, but we'll see later that this is, will only be possible if public authorities also address the topic. In our ambition in the medium term for 2025, we're planning that 50% of our business activity be based on these uh, non-combustion alternatives and that there will be 40 million smokers across the world who will who thanks to these alternatives will s not smoke cigarettes anymore so where do we stand in the first quarter of this year 30 percent of our business was based on non-combustion alternatives and more than 20 million smokers across the world switched to a heated tobacco product 70 percent of them have completely stopped smoking cigarettes, but we won't stop there. Our ambition, as I indicated, is really to build a world without cigarettes. And our president said it's possible to consider in countries where the public authorities are taking this topic seriously, we can eradicate, eradicate cigarettes in 10 to 15 years. This is a medium term goal that's possible, but the sine qua non condition for this comes from the fact that obviously companies must invest in order to develop technologies, to develop solutions. Consumers must also make an effort to switch to these new technologies, and the state has a dominant role to play. The state must look at things with a new eye based on modernity, so what solutions exist to build an environment that will help consumers adopt these new technologies. If I come back to France, because of administrative inertia or a lack of courage or the principle of precaution, public authorities are not yet in this approach uh, of modernity to look at these products to be able to offer smokers a better choice than just continuing to smoke. To conclude, I would say that technological progress only makes has meaning if at a time we establish a high quality dialogue between public authorities and industry in order to serve the world, to build a better world. Some have already talked about this of progress, of transformation, and of course, Technology and innovation is a way of doing this, but it's not a goal in and of itself. Thank you. Thank you for having uh, respected your time. I'm now giving you a minute each to answer a question. It's going to be even more complicated. Let's try to say something tangible. I want an example of public intervention or public policy that would be useful to foster innovation in your ecosystem that won't just be a subsidy, even though I'm open to that possibility. A tangible example where we could uh, have a, a meaningful public policy, so we'll go in the same order. Okay, I'll keep it short. Companies have a lot of have solutions and they need to be supported. I have in mind something quite tangible without 
we need to accelerate R&D and innovation capacities. We need a, a, a research tax credit that's devoted to a zero net emission route that's well financed, and that could be uh, encouraging and give companies the means to provide solutions even more quickly. That's a concrete example. Stéphane Israël. Stéphane Israël, <clears throat> our sector is quite specific because we can't multiply the actors in such a strategic sector. So to be in a nutshell, we need two things. First of all, we're the expression of a co-public and private investment and that's been the case for 40 years and for launchers with the constraining rules and Ariane 5 was this expression and Ariane 6 is the same. So we need to make sure that this operates properly. Everybody has to keep up to its commitments. And uh, for the public sector, we need to continue to consolidate investments around Ariane 6 with the uh, uh, rules of the games. <clears throat> and in short, uh, when a state gives money, the employment is that there's a geographical return for the employment, but uh, as a counterpart, well, the states are with you to invest, uh, but it's a bit to, con to continue the film and to prepare the new generation. We, have, we need to stimulate more internal competition, but not doing that in a way that will destroy uh, the European solidarity, because when you're faced to what you're faced in the US, for example, we can't afford to work on in our own on our on our side so uh, you need c competition on uh, new rocket elements uh, that enable a new convergence and uh, uh, the public agency the european uh, agency the european commission that's how they organize this internal commission uh, competition so that enable <coughs> innovations and to maintain the solidarity within the three countries uh, france germany and italy Education for me. I will insist on the education. Everybody complains not finding the, the the right resources, in particular in technology in technological enterprises. Everybody complains that the youth are no longer available, not adapted. Uh, people wonder if it's a. Uh, if it's uh, the school that's not well suited for the youth rather than the youth not being su adapted to the schools uh, yeah video games are better adapted to the modern world but if they lost uh, their uh, capacity to concentrate uh, well i don't know anyway um, i'm dreaming of a pu public public policies uh, where we train the, the the youth and the elderly also to uh, technological progress but and where we use uh, the new methods new technologies to disseminate a mass education in a more personalized and faster, quicker fashion. Thank you, Belinda. Belinda. Uh, Belinda. I would um, go in for skills. Um, currently, you realize that there are a lot of, you know, opportunities when it comes to tech for young ones out there. But the issue is that they don't have the requisite skills that allows them to, to be able to tap into these opportunities. And so um, there has to be a policy. I know that Ghana has, there was a draft um, national science and technology and innovation policy, but there has to be a policy that allows individuals to, you know, acquire skills that will allow them to tap into this tech opportunities that are out there. There also has to be a, a policy that supports innovation in Ghana. It is so difficult to, you know, um, start up a business or a company in Ghana because the process is so rigorous and you might even end up giving up. And so if there's a policy that facilitates innovation and entrepreneurship, makes it easier for individuals to, <coughs> sorry, acquire skills and from there able to start up their own business, I mean a tech business, a tech company, these are the things that will help the country to accelerate. These are the policies that will help the youth in Ghana to acquire skills and then to go on to start their own businesses and companies, which we really need in Ghana. Thank you. And Jean Paulès. Jean Paulès, Jean Paulès, yes. I was just addressed that earlier, but the public authorities is an essential actor in uh, technological progress and appropriation by consumers. Acceptance by uh, their role is, is essential. And if I go back to our product development that we have had with new alternatives, uh, it's urgent that the public authorities uh, 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 take up the uh, existing technologies that they develop 
more science, to be uh, even more reassuring on the fact that these alternatives are a, a better choice than, they could, than to continue to smoke. And I'd like to share with you something interesting. At the beginning of the year, uh, there was a, a study carried out by IFOP, uh, which uh, showed that 70% of the French uh, that was a part of the survey uh, thought that it was useful or very useful that a public health uh, organization supply scientifically proven uh, data on the solutions uh, outside of combustion. We know the public opinion is expecting uh, the, the state to play their role uh, on these aspects and uh, this uh, uh, this will to uh, steer clear from dogmatic positions without taking into account technological progress. This is no longer uh, accepted. And um, there's, um, so for the 11 million French smokers, uh, 15 million if we had temporary smokers, uh, well, if we think of that, the role as a, the state has a major role to play. Uh, if it, there no, no, there's not a, the right exchange between the public authorities, the consumers, and the producers. Well, the time has come to interact with the room. So please, if you have, your que if you have questions, we will... Um, uh, take your questions. We can start. We have a s little bit of a uh, store of questions. The first question is for Stefan. These space activities uh, give rise to uh, degradation of the space environment. So what precautions do you take to be more responsible within the scope of your activity? Well, firstly, the space uh, essentially serves to better live on, on Earth and to live in a more sustainable way. That's the first thing to say. It's thanks to space that we have capacities to monitor the climate change. Uh, 26 of the clim essential climatic variables can only be monitored from the space, from outer space. And the space serves to, the, to sustainable development through uh, the application it generates. The uh, second thing is that uh, as far as the launchers, there's a, a law in France on space, space operations, and it, there's no equivalent elsewhere. And for Ariane 6, we will be, we'll have to leave behind us a clean space. That is the, uh, the top uh, stage um, will have to, de to be taken out of its orbit, and so it should leave no traces in this, in the space. It's costly. We lose performance. Uh, because of that, our dear friends, competitors in the U.S. don't have this constraint. So instead of uh, carrying several satellites, we have to do that. We have to bring back that top stage back on Earth. And then the third question is rather on the side of our clients and the oper satellite operators. So it's the challenge of how the over multiplication of satellites in low orbit will be compatible with a sustainable uh, space. and. Um, a usable lower orbit in France. We ask the satellites when they finish their job in the low orbit after five or seven years to be take, removed from orbit, have a fuel uh, capacity to leave this orbit. We'll have to invest, um, whether on a regulatory uh, aspects, uh, that's the management of space traffic, but also we'll have to work on new technologies that will enable uh, when you have clusters to, to, to when you have satellites in space to, 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 to go and pick them up and you know, remove them from the orbit. So we'll have to have uh, very rigorous uh, specifications so that these big con constellations can coexist harmoniously and avoid the r risk of collision. I must say that our client Amazon, which has a 3,300 3, satellite project, is very sensitive on this aspect. They made proposals, and it's true of another client we deployed, OneWeb, but it's, least, it's less the case for Mr. Musk and SpaceX, who have the ambition of uh, deploying 42,000 uh, satellite, 4,200 satellites, and we haven't heard about their commitment in turn of uh, the sustainability of the low orbit of their satellites. Uh, other questions from the floor? Any other questions, comments? Please, don't hesitate. The goal here is to have the best exchanges possible with you all. I guess, yes, we have, uh, but we don't have a microphone in the room, unfortunately. Uh, yes, it's coming, slowly but surely. Uh, the carbon capture, what are the disruptive technologies that are mature or still 
not there, but can uh, uh, let us uh, hope. Well, these are technologies we're looking at. Some projects are ongoing. Uh, there is work being done today. Uh, some are operational. Uh, the question is always the same in techn technological progress, especially for financial people. Does it work? Does it work at a large scale? Is it profitable? So today it's working, not at a large scale, but there's no reason it shouldn't. Uh, the profitability, of course, depends on the cost of energy. So uh, today, what I say is that the energy crisis uh, we're undergoing today is uh, an opportunity, unique opportunity to speed up research on the energy efficiency and which in the energy transition well in energy transition you have the word transition that's very important uh, transition is uh, a burden it will take time and in the energy transition probably the uh, energy efficiency was underestimated underinvested the uh, uh, carbon capture is something that's happening slowly but surely so we have a time for one additional question last question So you said, Ariane Spaz, that the satellites were taken out of orbit. What do they become? Well, they, when they are in low orbit, they de disintegrate. And when they enter the atmosphere, you have to be careful. You have to avoid to have pollutions at that time related to the components of these satellites. But normally, after five or seven years, when they rotate around the Earth, they finish their duty and their job, they just disintegrate uh, as uh, while they enter in the atmosphere. So the uh, let room for other satellites that can be and replace them. We have time for uh, still time for questions. We have three minutes, three minutes. Uh, so one question here. Can somebody take a microphone to this person here? A question for Belinda. Shall I address it in English or in French? Well, wolf in English. Belinda. How do you develop technology in a country where power and electricity are, are missing, basically? So what, which kind of program do you put in place to, to develop uh, power and electricity in Ghana? OK, so um, there are um, power surges, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we don't have um, electricity in Ghana, but there are sometimes power surges. And what we try to do is that most of our, the trainings that we do for these individuals to build their tech-oriented um, startups or companies are mostly in person. And as I said, we have partners across the country, so we have um, decentralized the trainings. And so if the trainings are in person, you don't really have a problem when it comes to um, you know, electricity. But then even for our virtual sessions as well, we try to make room for, you know, we record the sessions such that individuals who partake can also have access to it. But for now, um, what we try to do are in-person sessions so that everybody can benefit. I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you. On va prendre une autre question. Alors, une question au fond de la salle. Ouais, le micro. Another question from the back of the room. Uh, question for Stéphane Israël. I'm with Zefalto. Uh, we have uh, air, uh, a space uh, experience uh, for with low carbon solutions. And I was wondering about the or uh, orbit tourism. With What's the program at uh, Ariane? It's very strong in the US. How are you positioned? in Europe for uh, tourism, space tourism. Well, first of all, between you and me, uh, we know each other, I'm sorry. Um, it shows that Ariane Group, Ariane Espace, and uh, it's true in the satellite, uh, we work with startups, and that's very important. And I think it's stupid to oppose the two ecosystems. It's destructive. Each ecosystem needs the, uh, the, the other, its counterpart. And your project is very interesting. Uh, but the second thing is that if it's a uh, low carbon uh, uh, space tourism, you're working on that, fine. But if on the other hand, um, with a view to uh, limited possibilities in the space it contributes to increase emissions, for me, that's not really the optimal solution or option. Uh, I don't have, I'm not, I don't have a lot of passion for these uh, 
uh, present uh, tourism experiences. I'm not too fond of that. But on the other hand, if the question is, uh, will there be more and more people in space uh, between uh, Earth and the moon, that's a real question. Will we have the capacity to have uh, a permanent presence of uh, people besides the five or six people who are in the space station to carry out activities that will eventually uh, enable to be launched from outer space and no longer have uh, the, the problems of launching from Earth. If it's a limited experience to move from, to, to spend a few minutes uh, uh, in, in a weightless atmosphere, well, that's, uh, mm, no. I think democracy is important in space and the fact that it benefits to the largest number of, uh, of, uh, of humans, and it's in this part of space that I'm interested in. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we're at the end of the session now, thanks to the audience.